All right, the goal for us today will create a new ordering database that will create a set of tables or entities containing attributes similar to the one that are being showed in this entity relationship diagram. In this entity relationship diagram, we have customers who place orders. Those orders consist of order lines that have the details about the individual products. We are going to start with creating a database and from there we are going to move on to actually working with SQL Server's designer first to create the actual entities and set the relationships. The second portion will actually look at and work on creating the data definition language to do the same actions without leveraging the database designer. Let's get started. The first part is once we're connected into SQL Server Management Studio, we're going to do a new database by right clicking on databases. Here we're going to give it a database name. I'm going to call it Professor Wolf's Ordering System. Okay. Some things I want to point out in practice versus in 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 in, in practice in um, the real world versus doing it uh, for demonstration and testing purposes. There are default configuration values here that we would typically change in practice. The location path of our data and log files. We typically will not leave them on a server C drive in the default SQL Server location. You would look to have some type of storage device you would change those paths to. Typically your data and your log files will be stored in different locations as well. Not, it would be very rare that on a production server that you would leave them on the C drive. Initial size. Think about your database, your system. Will you be preloading any data into it? You may want to carve out size in advance. If you know you're going to have a large database, if you have a historical database that you're migrating or referring to, you potentially may want to start that out with multiple gigabytes of space. Auto growth is fine if you're okay with the max size being unlimited. If you're limited by disk space, you may want to prevent unlimited auto growth but if you use unlimited auto growth, you also may want to put monitoring around your database and log file growth to ensure that you do not run out of this space. These are not necessary. They're not necessary for this tutorial, but I'm pointing these out in the future in case you should need those. There are other options and such um, available to consider in properties. Using the SQL help menu, you can become more familiar with each of these um, and why and when you may want to consider them. Uh, they're not necessary, again, currently, but these are things of consideration in practice we will we'll take into account for when creating a database for production on use. The same with file groups. Um, these are all part of the underlying um, design process, things to consider, um, where you may think defaults or you may utilize defaults in a lot of circumstances, uh, but they can run you astray over a period of time. So I like to point them out for anybody who's doing this for their first time. Um, so I have my name set. Um, I'll leave everything else the defaults for now, um, but just note that these are things to consider in the future. Um, once that is set, I will click OK. Um, but for this lecture, I want to look at the script. And I want to bring the script action to the clipboard so we can review it. Now, the purpose of this lecture is to I look at the actual um, data definition language, okay, the, the DDL um, that is written. And I'm sorry, I meant to actually script um, the action to a new query editor so we can actually see what's happening, okay. Now, the scripts are key. Uh, when working with the data definition language to somewhat understand what is happening. Essentially, every of those configuration values that we either changed or left as the default are going to be part of this script. Um, you'll see the primary one here, the create database. That's your command. That's what you're creating. Okay, The name of your database is there. 
and then all of the settings and configurations. So file location in the name of the file of your um, data file and the name and location of your log file, initial sizes, gross, um, and all of those things that we just saw. You scroll down through this, okay, you're going to see where the file group is going to place it on what file group. You know, if you're working on your own local computer, you typically only have your primary file group, um, and that'll be set in the last command. So if you hit save or hit OK on that previous screen, this is what would have happened behind the scene. So, okay. So where the tooling is beneficial for most of us, um, where we would actually just use that prompt to build it. When we migrate our databases between environments, sometimes from development to um, QA, or if we have a UAT or a production environment, we like to have the, the scripts. The scripts are so we can repeat things utilizing the same exact settings. So I always recommend to save the script, even if you allow SQL to do the work for you, so that way you can replay the script in another environment and get the same outcome. Okay, or tweak the script slightly um, where necessary to produce that environment's outcome. So what I always recommend, if you're going to take the script, put some comments in, right? Um, maybe the date um, in the SQL comments, two dashes for a single line, um, forward slash, asterisk for a multi-line. The date's always good. Um, you know, the purpose is always good. Create sample ordering database. And then the author never hurts. And maybe anything else that you want to include. And then you do a asterisk and a forward slash to get rid of the comment. The nice thing about this, you save the script in your script file. So if I was to do um, a file save as, and what I'll do here is in my folder is I will make a new folder called tutorials. Oops. DDL and create database script. Okay. And since the SQL file will be a .sql. So I'm good with that. I'll save it by executing it. Or sorry, I will create that database by executing that script. And you'll see the command completed successfully. Over on the left hand side in my object explorer, I will click refresh. And what I'll note there in my object explorer is that um, it's showing up here. Okay. And right now I don't have any tables, system tables or file tables because I haven't created anything yet. Um, I'll clear my editor window here, just so that is gone. We no longer need it. Highlight everything and remove it. And what I'll do now is I'm going to set out to create this design that we showed. So I'll start out by creating my objects in order of their relationships of what I can see here. So customers, I would start with and products I would start with. Okay. Orders depend on customers, so orders would be my next one, and then order line depends on. I've created my new database, Professor Wolf's ordering system. It's expanded. I see tables, and I'm going to right click and choose table. My first table, my customers table, based on this design, will have customer ID, first name, last name, country, city, postal code, street, and house number. Customer ID. This is going to be a primary key. Okay. We're going to set that by clicking on the key value up in our toolbar. The data type, we're going to make an identifier, and it'll become an actual um, integer. We're going to change some column properties on this since it's our primary key. We're going to make it an identity specification. We can turn that to a yes. Um, we're going to start it at 
let's say, a random number of 1259. And we're going to increment it by actual random numbers of um, 17. Okay. Now, why am I doing that? It's because I don't want somebody to be customer number one. I want them to think I'm established and they're not the first customer. Um, and I want to make it somewhat um, random by incrementing by 17 so that if people try to guess my customer numbers um, by incrementing them, if somehow they become known, it makes it a little bit harder to do so. Okay. Um, the first name field, let's say Varchar, and let's pick a reasonable size for first name. 25 characters should be safe. Last name, Varchar, let's try 30 characters for that. I'm unchecking allow null because my expectation is everybody's going to have a first name and last name. We're going to catch their address. Um, we'll do that Varchar 100. We'll check their city, Varchar. Um, let's do 40 just in case. State. Var, um, this will be char. Everyone's city abbreviation will be two in length. Zip code, for the sake of this demonstration, we'll make it char five. We'll just capture the five digit zip code. Uh, we'll capture their email address and we'll make that a var char 100, just in case anyone has a long email address. We're going to require all these fields um, and then We'll capture phone or primary phone. We'll make that um, a char. And what we'll do is um, capture only 10 characters of that. Um, we'll store it in its raw format. We'll allow our applications to actually do any formatting or parsing. But we'll require a character of char. And then a secondary phone of char of 10 as well. Okay. So that'll be our customer structure. Now, let's take a look at what the data definition language looks like for that actual table. If we click on um, the actual save here to generate change script, what you'll see is it's going to do a create table for us. Create table is the way to make tables in SQL. So this is pretty standard. Um, across the board. It's the compliant, ANSI compliant. So regardless of our database, for the most part, unless we chose data types that don't exist in our other, in other database products, this would be fairly safe or fairly common data definition language that we would see. So if we hit save, it's going to run this create script. Now, one concern is it's got um, table one in the um, name. So we're not going to want it to be table one. We're going to want to obviously change that to be something reasonable which will be our customers table. Okay. And then it's going to add the constraint for the primary key and such. Okay. There's a few different ways to do that in SQL. With this uh, script that it creates, this is how it does it in SQL Server. All right. If I click no here and just click the save button, this will become a pop-up to choose the name. I'll call this customers. Okay. So this is how the designer allows us to build a table without having to write the SQL command. If we refresh over here, you'll now see that customer's table is there. Now to use the designer to do our next table, let's say we're going to do our products table. Let's say product ID, integer as well. Um, again, come down and make that an identity column. Yes. Um, let's start that at a seed of a thousand with an increment of one. Okay, just so we have four-digit um, product IDs as a starting point. We'll check next to it, make it the key for our primary key. We'll make it have a product name. We'll make that a varchar of 100. Means any product names are lengthy. Uh, product description uh, varchar max will give us a lot of room for selling the item. We'll indicate the quantity. Um, we'll do QTY on hand. And that's an integer. We're only going to have whole units. 
we're going to go with a purchase price and that'll be a decimal and if we do 10 comma 2 that gives us enough for eight places and two decimal places and we're going to give it a selling price a decimal as well uh, we're going to um, leave that as our only items currently uh, for our product we'll click save again and we'll call this TBL or we'll call this products that's our basic product table and we'll close the tab now we'll right click we'll review it now we'll do another table we're going to give this one our order ID integer um, make that primary key. We'll go down and set our identity again. Again, we don't want people to think they have the first order. Um, we'll start at an increment of 5,000. Okay, or C to 5,000. What an increment of 12, just for fun. Okay. We'll put the customer ID who placed the order on here, and that's going to be a, an integer as well. It's going to match the same data type as in our customers table. And typically, we'll want to make the field look the same, so customer ID. We'll give it an order date. We'll do a date time so we know when that order was placed exactly. And that will be all we'll track for the time being. And we'll save this. And this will be orders. And a very simple basic ordering system. And then we can right click over here and see it. And now our last table will be our order details table so we're going to do an order detail ID integer um, order ID integer product ID integer quantity ordered integer and then their purchase price and that'll be the decimal Ten comma two. We might also want to capture the selling price at the time the person placed the order to see if we're giving out any discounts for some reason. So we will do that as well. Okay. Capture the selling price as well. So we know if there's a difference. We can calculate if there was a difference. The order detail ID, that's going to become a primary key. We'll make that an identity column. Okay. And then the rest should be good to go. And we'll save this table as order details. A little different than the diagram that I showed, but essentially the same type of database, same type of tables and structures. Just made some tweaks from the diagram, from the initial design. So that's our structures. Now the next part here is to set our relationships. So what we do in SQL Server is we go to the database diagram, the new database diagram. It's going to ask if we want to support objects for that. We click yes. We choose all of our entities and they show up. Now, as you see, they're not connected currently. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of order these similar to how they were in that diagram we saw. Just kind of click on them, drag them, and move them. Now, we have to set the relationships. Well, customers this is related to orders. If we click and drag on the field customer ID and overlay it on customer ID, you'll see the primary key table is customers, the foreign key table is orders, and we hit OK. That'll give us our relationship, and you have a one to many just like in the design. Now, note there's an asterisk on these two tables. What that means is that hasn't been committed to the database yet. We'll need to hit save and commit those changes to the structure. 
the other thing to know about this is you want to set all of this up properly before we add data to preserve our referential integrity. Uh, so we do not want to allow for data into our database prior to setting these relationships. If we do, things could potentially get values entered that are incorrect. So order ID here goes up to order ID here. Primary key table orders order ID, foreign key table order details order ID, and hit OK. And then the same with product ID goes up to product ID here. And we check products to product ID, order details to product ID. Okay, now we'll see all four changes have structure changes. If we hit save the diagram, and we'll just call this Professor Wolf's ordering system diagram. It'll tell us that these tables are going to need choir changes. And now our relationships are in place. So we have our entire database built at this point. Now what we can do to take a look at the data definition language as that was intended for this chat is we can take a look at our database. Okay. And if we right click on it, and if we go to tasks, we can generate scripts. Here, there's a little wizard that comes up allowing us to generate our database scripts. If we click next through the first screen, we can choose the objects. If we have the entire database and all the database objects, or we can just choose specific objects. I'm going to get this entire database and all the database objects so that I can share it with you guys in the chat system. So I'll save this. I'll save this to a script called Professor Wolf's ordering system.sql. Okay. And then I will have that there saved in that file. Click next. You'll see that it's going to go through and get the list of objects. It shows you it created the database, it created the customers, the order details, the orders, the product, and then saved it to a file. Click finish. And what we can do now is we can go and do file open. And we can go and um, go find that file. And you'll see it here. Okay. The first part of the script is like what we saw a brief earlier where it creates our actual database so we can replay the creation of our database and all of the settings. The second part will be where our tables come in. So here is our script to create our customers table. Okay. And that shows the actual primary key being created uh, for the customer ID. Okay. That is right here. Now we look and see our order details table creation, our orders table creation, and our products table creation. And then at the very bottom, we see these alter tables. These alter tables statements here are for each of the relationships. Okay. And they're not called foreign keys in the actual SQL language, it's, it's a constraint. Okay. It's adding a constraint that is a foreign key from one table to the other. So it has um, the order details getting the foreign key constraint in this case. Okay. Um, it's got a name that's so it's uh, basically an object on the database. Um, the field. Okay. And then the table it references the orders table and the original order ID. And you'll see that for each of the relationships we built. Okay. So that, and then when it's all said and done, the database is built, the tables are built, it leaves the database in the setting of capable of being able to be read write. Okay. So as far as the data definition language goes, these core components here create table pieces. They can be reused 
um, with other database languages. You'll see them um, as far as the ANSI standard goes, as long as, again, the database um, has the same data types as what you have. So if we wanted to create a table, we use create table. We indicate the name of the table and then the fields that are in data types for each of, and settings for each of those fields, just like that. Okay, so that is the database definition language. You do not have to actually create it in SQL Server. You can use the designer in SQL Server Management Studio, but I highly recommend that you use the designer once in your lowest non productional environment, and then you create a database script that you can reuse in upper level environments to ensure that your configuration is the same across environments. And that concludes this tutorial.